friends, good morning. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My name is Pastor Matthias. Welcome to worship here at Leroy UMC. And brothers and sisters, this morning, as every Sunday, we are gathered because we have been called. We have gathered together to worship a Savior and a God who knows us by name and who calls us to purposes and ministries beyond our imagining. And friends, at this time, as we prepare to listen for God's call in our lives, I would invite us to join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Holy Lord, we come to you as a people desperate for your presence and eager for your foundation. Lord, if we come here this morning with joy and thankful hearts, then Lord, let us praise you for the life that you have given. If we come here this morning with exhausted spirits and tired minds, then Lord, help us to find the rest and the renewal that you offer. Lord, whatever state our soul or spirit may be in in this hour, let us draw close to you and feel your grace as we center ourselves on your presence and your peace. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us worship the Lord. Brothers and sisters, Christ Jesus is beside us in our brightest and in our darkest moments, inviting us to find peace and to find strength as we set all things down and offer them to him in our prayers. And so, friends, if you have a prayer that you would like us as a church family to lift up, go ahead, either share it down in the comment section below this video, or you can always text any prayers to me. Uh, my number should be on the screen. But friends, a few prayers we've been asked to lift up this morning. Uh, prayers have been asked for the Satterfield family as they grieve together the loss of Chad Satterfield, Ken and Sue's son, uh, this week. And we certainly do pray that 
as Christ is a savior who weeps with us. That Christ may be beside the entire Satterfield family this morning. That Christ may remind them that they are not alone in this difficult season and that Christ is a savior who can guide them through it to the peace that is on the other side. Uh, Barb Dean has asked for prayers for her mother, Marlis, uh, out in Kansas, uh, who is battling COVID uh, this week in the nursing facility where she lives. And Barb, with you, well, we ask that as God is a God who invites us to cling to him in our moments of need, that God may be there for Marlis and may offer Marlis the grace that can guide her through this illness and the peace that can be there for all of us in sickness and in uncertain moments. Uh, prayers also for the O'Neill family, uh, for Nick and Angie as Dave O'Neill uh, battles pneumonia and COVID in the hospital and faces, well, faces some very heavy transitions uh, this week. I would ask that we all together as a church family lift up the entire O'Neill family and lift them up to a savior who knows our struggles and who is beside us in every difficult valley that we have to face in this life. I would ask that we pray that Christ be with the O'Neill family and guide Dave through the valley he is in now to greener pastures that Christ leads us to ahead. Uh, Michelle Benz has also asked for continued prayers for her Aunt Dorothy and for uh, her dad, Ron Stutzman, both of whom continue to battle with COVID this week. Michelle, along with you, we ask that God may give healing to Ron and to Dorothy, to their bodies, and may give peace to their minds and may lead them this and all the days that are to come. Uh, and Janet Sutter has also asked for prayers for her friend Grace, uh, who is recovering this week from health challenges. And Janet, with you, we ask that the Holy Spirit may be present for Grace, that the Holy Spirit may revive and renew Grace in her soul, in her body, in her mind. And brothers and sisters, with these and with all the prayers, with all the joys and all the concerns that are on our hearts and on our minds, with all of these things, let us go before the Lord our God in whom there is understanding and above all in whom there is peace. Friends, let us pray. Good morning, church family. Please join me in prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, not so much to be understood as to understand, not so much to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we awake to eternal life. Father, we now pray the prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this morning we're continuing with our series on the book of Exodus and the kingdom of priests image that God gives us uh, by taking a look at the call story of Bezalel, uh, a character who's often, I think, overlooked in the book of Exodus and overlooked in scripture in general. Uh, but our reading today comes from Exodus chapter 35, verse uh, 30, and then going into chapter 36, uh, verse 2. Uh, but friends, listen now for the word of the Lord. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with divine spirit, with skill, intelligence, and knowledge in every kind of craft 
to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood in every kind of craft. And he has inspired him to teach, both him and Holiabab, son of Ahismak of the tribe of Dan. He has filled him with skill to do every kind of work done by an artisan or by a designer or by an embroider in blue, purple, and crimson yarns and in fine linen or by a weaver, by any sort of artisan or skilled designer. And Bezalel and Ahilab and every skillful one to whom the Lord has given skill and understanding to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has instructed. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, please pray with me. Lord, who calls us to be holy, May this message consecrate us to you. Lord, who calls us to be set apart, may our hearts obey you as God. And Lord, who calls us to the truth, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. There were no priests in the early church. I know that's an odd thing to say, especially in the middle of a sermon series meant to talk about how we're all a kingdom of priests, but in a sense, it's true. Not once do any of the four Gospels or any of the New Testament letters use the word priest to refer to the earliest Christian leaders. And there's a number of possible reasons for that. There's the theological reason that Christ was supposed to be the one and only high priest of the church. There's the practical reason that maybe the New Testament authors didn't want to confuse their readers into thinking they were talking about the Jewish priests at the temple in Jerusalem. But a much deeper reason for the strange absence of such formal priests in the early church may be because by the first century, the word priest had come to represent much of what it still does for us today. For a first or 21st century believer, the word priest stirs up images of ordained figures in ornate robes, performing worship rituals shrouded in mystery. And when we think about what it means to be a priest, we're most likely to think about public speaking, theological ed education, and reverent traditions. And that isn't the kind of leadership that the earliest church had in mind. The early church was surprisingly fluid when it came to leadership. There were all kinds of roles and titles and functions filled by all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds. There were bishops, episcopoi, elders, presbyteroi, local healers, teachers, prayers, traveling prophets, and all sorts of people filling all sorts of needs in the body of Christ. Yet for all of these roles that emerged in the early church, the single most popular term used to refer to the earliest Christian leaders was diakonos. It's where we get the word deacon from. And incredibly, a diakonos was about as far as you could get from the stereotypical priest. In sharp contrast to the reverent respectability and ritualistic piety that we sometimes associate with priestly leadership, the earliest Christians took the title diakonos from the Greek word meaning to serve. 
In other words, to be a leader, to be a minister of the earliest church, to be a diakonos was to wait on people, to fix problems, to clean up messes, and to serve the felt needs of the church family and those around it. It is a dramatic reversal of expectations, but there were no formal priests in the earliest church, just a new kind of servants. Bezalel didn't feel like a priest. In fact, if public speaking, rituals, and reverent piety are what you associate with being a priest, then Bezalel was about as likely to become a priest as I am to become an NBA star. Bezalel was an ordinary man. There wasn't much special or distinct about him. He was a stonemason a carpenter, a handyman who spent his days doing mortar work, wood carvings, and construction. He was phenomenal at it. He was an artist of his craft who could design and build just about anything that you could dream up. However, Bezalel was not an eloquent speaker. He had not received advanced theological training. He did not understand the ins and outs of worship. He was not all that familiar with the scriptures. And to top it all off, he had a tremendous case of stage fright. Nothing about Bezalel's personality or background checked any of the boxes for becoming a traditional priest. He was a good, hard-working, ordinary person, but not a priest. Or at least, he didn't think that he was. But unfortunately, or miraculously, depending on how you look at it, God seems to have disagreed with that assessment. Because when Moses came back down Mount Sinai and shared with the people God's plans for a new opulent sanctuary where the people could draw close to the Lord, Moses concluded the plans by announcing, and the Lord has called by name Bezalel to do every kind of work that the Lord requires. And like getting a promotion that you don't feel prepared for, or having me make a surprise announcement that you are giving the sermon next Sunday, I imagine that was initially one perplexing and even horrifying moment for Bezalel. And maybe he protested, thought to himself, I'm no leader, I'm no spokesman, no manager. I don't even like praying at the dinner table. How could I be called by God? And yet, the call is made. And though Bezalel may not have seen it at first, behind his call lurks unbelievable levels of grace. We're told that God calls Bezalel, and that isn't particularly unusual. God called Moses, called Samuel, called Isaiah, called Saul. God called many of the great pillars of our faith. But Bezalel? Bezalel was the guy you bump into at the grocery store, the neighbor that you invite to game night, the routine face in the crowd on Sunday morning. Bezalel is ordinary to a T, and yet the Lord calls him. Why? Because our God doesn't just call great mythic figures Our God calls every single one of us, no matter how ordinary we may think we are. We're told that God calls Bezalel by name. 
And that isn't particularly unusual either. To know someone by name at the time meant to know them in a deeply personal way, and God knew many people by name. But him? Bezalel's life wasn't all that interesting. In fact, maybe it was a little boring. He's typical. He wasn't even prom king. And yet the Lord knows him. Why? Because our God doesn't just know about the ones in the spotlight. Our God knows you, knows your skills, your thoughts, your hopes, your dreams, and knows what you are capable of, whether you know it or not. We're told God filled Bezalel with divine spirit and with skill to do every kind of work. And that isn't necessarily bizarre either. The Holy Spirit gave the leaders of Israel countless gifts from working miracles to prophesying to parting Red Seas and commanding armies. But building, Woodworking and masonry are daily skills, things that we use all the time for mundane life. Those aren't dramatic, miraculous abilities, and yet the Spirit gave it. And why? Because sometimes our God equips us with the skills that meet real needs and work daily miracles in people's lives like the need for a roof, the need for a new wheelchair ramp, or the need for a place to worship. But most incredible by far, we're told that God called, knew, and equipped this ordinary believer to work in accordance with all that the Lord has instructed. And that is particularly unusual because the word that scripture uses for work, malaka, doesn't just mean to labor or to do something, but much like that bizarre title, diakonos, that the early church would latch on to centuries later, malaka means to serve. Bezalel is to be a leader of early Israel. He is to be a minister. He is to be a priest in God's kingdom of priests, but not because Bezalel is a great public speaker, a great prayer, a worship leader, or any sort of stereotypical priest that we envision in our minds. No, God has called, known, and equipped this supposedly ordinary believer to be a priest because he is meant to serve. And because it isn't the dramatic miracles done by famous holy men that change the world. It's the ordinary acts of loving service done by God's ordinary priests that build God's kingdom one life at a time. The people of God have needs. There are hidden pains that go unaddressed every day. There are deep-rooted fears that keep us awake at night. There are misperceptions and misconceptions that keep us apart. Financial and material needs that drive us to worry. Grief and guilt that are too heavy to carry. There are even worship spaces and safe places that need to be created. God's children have needs in this world and God calls for servants to meet those needs. And from famous figures to common workers, from Moses to Bezalel, from Exodus to the church, God calls us, calls you, to be a new kind of servant priest working in the lives of others. Bezalel is not alone. 
His call in Exodus 35 is not unique. God's gifts, God's grace, God's call rings out among all the people. God knows each one of us by name because God sees possibilities we may not even see in ourselves. God stirs our hearts and puts a hunger in our souls to be a part of something meaningful because God calls us to be a part of the small miracles that unfold every day. And God has equipped us with abilities to build, to care, to create, to listen, to play music, to cook, to give, to teach, to heal, to serve. Because ancient Israel wasn't just a nation of ritual-keeping priests and ordinary nobodies. It was a kingdom of servant priests, building living temples where God may dwell. And the earliest church wasn't an organization of reverent ritual keepers. It was the body of Christ filled to the brim with diaconos, servant ministers, building God's kingdom in the ways they served the needs of God's children. Bezalel may not have felt like a priest, he may not have been a gifted public speaker. He may not have been the most knowledgeable about Scripture, and he may have only seen himself as an ordinary person living an ordinary life. In other words, Bezalel may have been one of us. But God called him to be a priest all the same to use the gifts that God gave him to serve the people with every brick he laid and wall he finished. God called him to be a teacher to all the workers on his crew that he talked with on a lunch break, to be a healer to every person that he listened to and cared for, to be a priest in every act of self-giving service that he made. And not just Bezalel, but each of us. Bezalel's story, Exodus 35, should challenge us. It's designed to make us ask questions, to rethink and wonder to ourselves how does God know you? And what potential does God see in your life that you may have missed? What gifts did the Spirit give to you? And how will you use them to be a blessing to your brother, your sister? What work and what need does God call you to? And how will you go out and minister to it this week, this day, but most of all, how will you answer God's call to become a priest by the service that you give? Thanks be to God for it. Amen. Friends, please pray with me. Holy God, Call out to us from the mountain and let us hear your summons to service. Lord, in the ordinary lives that we live, show us our extraordinary potential. Lord, when we discount and forget ourselves, remind us of the miraculous gifts and the careful skills that you empower us with. And in a world riddled by more need than we can understand, Lord, let us feel your call to be a kingdom of healers, of teachers, of preachers, of musicians, of caregivers, of listeners, of builders, of priests, living for you in the service that we give. Thanks be to God. Amen. And brothers and sisters, as a church family called to be 
God's priests, God's servants in the lives of others, we do have a very special announcement, something that, well, I'm very excited to share with everyone. Uh, this week, our church family heard uh, from Chaddock House. It is a ministry that houses and supports um, young individuals and youth going through crisis. Uh, we heard from Chaddock House, and they sent out a a wonderful thank you video uh, to our church and to other churches for supporting their ministry, for offering uh, Christmas gifts to some of the Chaddock kids and for making sure that they had a wonderful holiday season. And so as we talk about what it means to be God's servants, to be a blessing to others, I thought it was only right to share the uh, Chaddock House thank you with the whole church family, uh, after which we will serve the Lord through the gifts that we offer to Christ's ministries here at this body of Christ. But friends, a special message from our friends at Chaddock House. Hi everyone, this is Shauna Benell from Chaddock and I just wanted to reach out to you today and say thank you. We had a wonderful Christmas this year at Chaddock and we could not have done that without the support of all of you. And so I just want to take a moment to thank you for stepping up, for thank you, to thank you for giving our kids such a great Christmas. They were excited, they were happy, and uh, you're going to see a couple little boys at the end that, that can tell you about uh, what their favorite gifts were. But just wanted to, to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You guys did so much to make Christmas really good here this year, and uh, our kids and all of us here appreciate it. Thank you to all the churches. And my favorite our my favorite gift was a RC car. Thank you to all the churches. My favorite gift was the was a little scooter and the skateboard and and all of the new clothes that you got me because all of the clothes I had doesn't fit. So thank you.
Friends, before we end the service, a few announcements. Number one, uh, we will continue to offer in-person worship at 9 a.m. Sunday mornings at the sanctuary. Of course, you're more than welcome to continue to worship with us online. These online services uh, will continue. Uh, but for the in-person services at 9, uh, since numbers for our region seem to be going in the right direction uh, in terms of COVID, uh, and since we're in back in Tier 1, uh, we can, uh, I guess, put a halt to using Sign Up Genius. Uh, we have plenty of space in our sanctuary to spread folks out. Uh, given the uh, requirements that we have right now. So if you'd like to join us Sunday morning for in-person worship, just be sure and join us here at the sanctuary at 9. We'll find a spot for you in the sanctuary. And worst case scenario, we always have overflow seating. Uh, but you're more than welcome to join us in person. Uh, also, Sunday school uh, has uh, begun again starting this morning. Uh, all of our Sunday school youth will have face masks and will be practicing uh, many of the same safety procedures that they've been using at the uh, local school. Uh, but Sunday school is here at the church, 9 o'clock Sunday morning. Uh, and Pathfinders is also starting back up again this Wednesday. Uh, Pathfinders will be at the church. They'll be here in Fellowship Hall, again, using masks spread out, staying uh, as safe as possible. And finally, friends, as always, if you are new here or if you would like to know more about our church family, if you would like to know ways that you can be a minister and the ways that you can serve others in this community, feel free to reach out to us. Text the word new to the number on your screen. We would love to get you involved in this church family and to help you be that servant priest for God. But friends, with these announcements shared, I'd invite you to receive the final blessing. Now go forth into the world to recognize the gifts that our God has given you, to understand the miracle that our God knows you, and to hear God call you to serve and to work wonders in the lives of others. And friends, may the blessing of Almighty God be with each and every one of you now and evermore. Amen. Friends, the service is ended. Go in peace.